want to welcome everybody to our September meeting of the Greater Houston Aquarium Club and a huge shout out to Paul and everybody here at TNT for hosting us. It's a pleasure as always. Thank you, thank you. I hope everybody goes and takes a spin through. Look at all the amazing reefs that he's got set up. Um, Paul, when we were talking about uh, kind of a topic, we like to interact with our, our sponsors and find out. And he said, you know, honestly, a lot of people come with, with issues with a reef, you know, and they're always fighting this reef problem. So he said, you know, that'd be a great topic. And I said, excellent. So tackling it is um, a little challenging, at least how to, to orate it. So I kind of broke it down how I my approach is and that's by breaking it down to to the essential problems and hopefully in understanding these things that you'll gain a, a better understanding of what's going on in your reef. Um, I think one of the first issues with that many newer aquas have is water parameters. Um, what should your salinity be at? How should you measure salinity? Um, refractometers are amazing. I love a refractometer. I love a digital refractometer. Not everybody's wanting to, to lay out $250 for a digital refractometer. I can dig that. You can use a hydrometer. Hydrometers have a little trick to them. Basically, it's a piece of plastic that floats in the water and it tells you your specific gravity. That's how we measure the amount of salt in the water. Well, the problem that I've found with hydrometers is people will pour violently into them and then they'll get a couple bubbles underneath it. Well, when you've got bubbles under a little piece of plastic that's floating, it will give you a wonky reading. The best thing to do is kind of tap it a few times and it should settle down. Um, Eventually, getting a refractometer, which is basically uh, kind of look at the light source, that's probably the best. Another thing that people fail to do is they'll get an awesome refractometer, and they will have it for like a year or two years, and you're like, man, I love this this refractometer. It's awesome. Look, why are my fish all dying? I don't understand. And they're like, oh, it's the salinity looks good, and you go, dude, you should probably measure your RO. They didn't zero it. So they've been fighting an off refractometer, and yeah, hammering these fish with like 1.0234 water, and they're wondering why they're dying. Um, How often should you recalibrate the refractometer? The, any tech would probably tell you to, you should always zero it before using it. Every time. But, do you? <laughs> I tend to, to do it if I start seeing something odd. Okay. If I like, all of a sudden, you know, pull some water on my tank and it's hitting it at like, you know, 1.040, and I'm going, dude, none of the fish are acting weird. My coral's just fine. I've got a feeling that that might be a weird number. So, you know, I'll, I'll kind of double check it and sure enough, it's off, you know. Um, rinse your refractometers with distilled water after use. Salt water is highly corrosive. One thing that refractometer suppliers do is they put a nice uh, fine tuning screw that is completely corroded, corrodible, dude. And it's right there. So the one thing that's gonna seize up is right where the water is. So dude, rinse it. You will save yourself a lot of money in the long run. Um, water. Whenever we're wanting to put water in our aquarium, um, we're wanting to make salt water. The natural inclination is, to, well, I'm just gonna pull out some tap water out of my sink and I'm gonna put some salt in there. All those minerals that make our water hard, that make Tanganyikans and Malawis love our water, 
those are all pollutants. That all that hard water, when it dumps into ocean water, is what creates Galveston. The algae loves that. Dude, basically we're just dumping pollutants into salt water. So if I were to, to mix that water and make salt water with it, what's gonna happen in my reef? It's gonna turn into a hot green mess. <laughs> what we want is the salt water out in the ocean doesn't vary ever. Like we're talking about one or two degrees over like a 10 year span. So we need a stable way to create water. So to create that water, we basically rip out all the minerals. So we're gonna use reverse osmosis water or distilled water. And that's basically, it has zero TDS. Usually two to three is an allowable amount. That's usually when you start looking at changing out your RODI filters. So you take that zero and then you mix salt and you know what, if you come back in a, in a next week and you do the same process, the salt will be the same. The amount of salt you put in should be the same, as long as you use the same salt. All salts are not made equal. Um, these are all manufactured. They're sometimes mined. Uh, coral life actually comes out of Louisiana. It's actually mined in Louisiana. Um, it's part of the sulfur making process. And they figured out a way to market a byproduct that they were gonna have to trash. Nice. So, um, but all salt's not made equal. So if you are doing a fish only, fish don't really care how much calcium and magnesium and iodide levels are in there. They really don't. Arguably, they don't even need full straight salt water. You can go to a 1.020, dude, they're rocking. Dude, they are happy. And honestly, a lot of people run a hypo saline system. Like, basically what it does is it makes the invertebrates have a hard time living. So it actually helps them in disease prevention. Hmm. But in a reef system, remember that your corals and stuff take all those little micronutrients, um, iodide, calcium, magnesium, all of these things, they need to be in a certain level. Too much, and it can plummet your tank. Too little, and your corals are starving. Now in the ocean, that little minor amount never sh shifts because the water kind of moves around, and there's a whole bunch of them. There's a whole bunch of them. They, they never run out. But in our aquariums, you know, you deplete the calcium in this tank and all of a sudden your corals will start suffering. So, if you're doing regular water changes, and a regular water change, in my opinion, on a salt water system would be about 100% every month. Now, I don't usually like to do 100% water change on a salt water tank. I prefer a 25% once a week. But time span, that's 100% in a month. Unless you have a rocking system with huge corals that are ripping things, if you've got two tiny little frags, the amount of calcium that they're pulling out is probably not that much. You're probably okay without dosing. My recommendation for dosing don't dose what you cannot test for. If you can't test for your calcium, then hammering calcium in there, I have seen more people go, oh my God, did my tank turn white and I've got white weird scaly patches on my glass. And I'm like, dude, what are you doing? And they're like, well, I, I hit it with reef code A and B and I, I, I dosed for the full tank even though I only did a 10% water change. And I'm like, whoa, what do you got in there? And they're like, I've got a frag of Montipora that's about a quarter. And you're like, whoa, dude. I think literally you're precipitating calcium out of the water column. It is so dense, it is raining bones in your aquarium. <laughs> yeah, know what you're testing for. Um, iodine, is needed at a small amount, toxic at higher levels. 
Um, you know, so I can't say that I always test, but once you get a, a good understanding of it, you'll get a better feel. But initially, whenever you're wanting to dose something really weird, know what you're, you know, be able to test for it. Um, you know, copper can become one of those things when you're dosing copper can can really get dangerous because you need a tiny amount, but it actually starts sucking up into live rock. So as you're dosing it, it's going into the live rock, so you have to constantly play around with that level. Um, let's see. Temperature. Um, I've heard of reefs running up to 84 degrees. I don't know what fantasy world they, that they dwell within. I have a hard time if it starts getting above 80. Um, I like to keep my reefs anywhere from about 75 to a 78. Um, I usually prefer 75 because I've got three degrees in which to climb or five degrees, whereas 78 you have two degrees. And if all of a sudden the AC breaks in the house, then I've got a longer span there before it gets hot. Um, when it starts hitting 80, I certain corals, especially Australian corals, will start acting up quick. They start sliming, they start dying. Um, you know, they don't like that warmer water. Um, when you're doing a water change, pay attention to the temperature of your water. The, I've seen a lot of people come rolling and be like, dude, I'm all ready for the water change. You know, and they're like, man, all of a sudden I did a water change and all my corals are dying. And you're like, where did, where did, what, what happened to your water? And they're like, well, I, I picked it up from, from y'all's shop. And you're like, well, all right, so I know the water's good. Where, where have you been? And they go, well, I, I went over to HEB and I left it in the back of the truck and then did Two hours later, I went ahead and headed on to the house, and I'm like, so you just hit a reef with 95 degree water? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's probably why it's dying. You know, do, do you got a chiller? And they're like, no. And you're like, chillers can be very effective. I, I will, it's not always needed, they're useful. Um, all right, so that kind of covers water, water parameter issues. A lot of times, regular water changes will fix things. Um, live rock. Let me double check. So, a lot of people talk about live rock. Live rock is where you're basically, this is kind of these areas, you know, in the reef that you're going to kind of put frags on. But basically, this is where the bacteria actually lives in your aquarium. There is no bio in your filter. You're spinning water back there. It's mostly mechanical and chemical filtration. The actual biological filtration occurs in tank. So you want a large amount of it, especially in a reef. Um, you want usually a pound to two pounds a gallon. So it's definitely well worth it. Do you have to get live rock? No. Arguably, you could put in holy rock and just hammer it with a whole bunch of uh, bacteria, and it would be fine. Why arguably? Well, theoretically, it was at the bottom of the ocean. I mean, that was old live rock. It just hasn't been live in, you know, probably a hundred thousand years. Okay. So, um, so drop live rock and and what I would call base rock because. Uh, I, I'll, I'll kind of break down what it is and where it comes from. Live rock is harvested from the ocean. Like, there's some dudes that were on a boat in Fiji with a hammer and just went to town. So it's not exactly the most ethical thing to buy. It's just, it, you know, you, you want to talk about the, the reef this just disappearing, you know, this is one of the problems. So, 
a lot of the hobby has tried to shift away from live rock as, as its kind of usage, yeah. you know, and go to more of a, like a real reef rock, which is a purple rock. Um, there's also aquacultured live rock, basically a whole bunch of yahoos with a, a, with a big flat bottom boat that go out off of Tampa and they just drop a whole bunch of rocks out in the ocean and leave it around for about a year and then they come back and they collect it. Bam, they've got live rock. <laughs> it, it works. Well, however, you know, kind of look into your source. Um, live rock basically is caught off the reef, pulled in, and nobody wants to ship it wet. I'm not certain if you've ever held wet rock, but wet rock weighs a lot more than dry rock. So they dry it. Well, a lot of those critters die. Like, it turns out that a lot of those critters need water. <laughs> now, some of them can make it, but dude, most of them need water. So, when the stores get it in, it's been on a boat from Fiji sitting in the sun baking. This is some pretty rank stuff, and it's pretty dead. Now, it was really cool initially because what they do is basically you take this lot, this dry rock, put it in your tank, and you know what all that dead stuff's now gonna do? It's gonna rot. And it's gonna actually feed you ammonia. And thus, you start your cycle and it actually kickstarts and feeds your cycle. That's why a lot of people use dry rock originally. Now, you can get cured rock. That would be, like Paul, he takes that dry rock and he basically puts it in a tank and he just kind of lets that, that nasty stuff fluff off and he basically gets it seasoned so it's not a huge stinky mess. And then you take that. You don't have as much ammonia then, so you'd have to kickstart off your own cycle. Um, with a real reef rock, it actually doesn't have any live rock characteristics at all. It's never been in the ocean, it's just kind of manufactured. You throw that in with some turbo start, and basically you just create your own live rock. Um, a lot of people, if you have a huge tank and you're building up a pile, you know, yay tall, if you can go out and get the 10 or $15 premium Tonga branch that looks really awesome, that might have all these cool hitchhikers, but that's a huge amount for that stack. And honestly, the stuff at the bottom probably doesn't matter. You could pile holy rock, and that's what we call base rock. And then you have face rock that's the nicer premium stuff. That's one of the, the tactics and the tricks. All right. The problem with live rock is it's harvested from the ocean, arguably pretty bad. Like, it's not exactly the happy happy part of the hobby that we're all really keen on. Um, and you can get hitchhikers. You don't get to pick what comes in on it. it our first introduction to the wonders of the mantis shrimp and <laughs> the wonders of really weird critters, sea spiders, and all these other wonderful little critters that you don't particularly like in your reef usually come in on live rock. There are little bitty eggs, there's something that survived, and all of a sudden you go, oh my God, what is that weird thing? And you're like, I don't know, and it requires like somebody that is a invertebrate biologist in Colorado to go, oh my God, I've, I've never seen a cry noise before, you know, much less than an aquarium. And you're like, was well, it bad? <clears throat> Arguably nothing in the ocean is bad. It's not like it's like evil, it has horns, and it just goes around sticking everything. But will it survive well and not murder things in your aquarium <laughs> is another thing. You know, mantis shrimp are great little critters. Probably not what I'd recommend for an average aquarium, but if, are they evil? Maybe a little. <laughs> but hitchhikers are something that you're not going to be able to control with live rock. So this is a point of introduction that you can't control. You know, you hear those dice rolling, that's the dice. And arguably, every time that you get coral and you don't dip, or even if you do dip, you can get hitchhikers. You know, 
it's not like you go through each little fold of the zoanthid and go, ah, dude, there you are, new to bronc. No, dude, nobody ever does that. Especially if you're in baby form. Yeah. You, you just literally might not ever see it in one of those little dimples. I yeah. Was, I got a sea spider that way. Yeah. Did it, everything. A little sea spider crawling around one day. Um, substrate. Another problem with, with a lot of tanks is substrate. So, I usually advocate for A or B. A is either no sand or light dusting. The, the deeper your sand, the more de, like that stuff's going to fall down there and you're not going to want to, to mess with it, you know? And you start developing detritus. And it basically becomes a wonderful net that catches all the Gucci. Right? And it collects all that Gucci. And then you, you've got all these weird organics that you can't get out of the tank. You're going to have to constantly stir the sand bed to get rid of them. Or you go deep. And that's what we call a deep sand bed. Usually that's like four to six inches. And you start actually, you don't ever want to disturb that sand bed. You don't want to stir it. Basically, it becomes a filter, and you start introducing critters like sand sifting starfish and cucumbers and stuff that lives down in there. And basically, it just lives, and it starts actually anaerobically processing nitrates. But if you were to stir it up, holy mackerel, that is a tank crash in the making. A stinky one. What's that? Stinky one. Yes, a very stinky one. Um, usually, I would kind of recommend that half an inch to an inch, um, you know, I know it's annoying, your high circulation will blow sand around, so you're going to constantly have to move it back and fill in holes, but trust me, fighting a deep sand bed is, is a nightmare. I don't usually <laughs> recommend sloping like I do in a freshwater tank. It looks really cool in a freshwater tank, in a saltwater tank, it just becomes a hot mess, just don't try it have a level sand bed. Um, light. You are the master of the light. Uh, you decide when it comes on, when it goes off, how potent it is. Um, most lights are controllable to some degree. I know some aren't. That definitely creates more challenges, but a lot of the new lights you can actually dial up and down in your intensity. Use this. Um, I can give you a lot of tricks to get rid of cyano, but if you do not address the root problem of the cyano, it will magically reappear. There is no silver bullet for these problems. Fixes do not occur, no changes occur in a, in a reef aquarium quickly. Good changes occur over time, you know, doing good habits. If you have a cyano problem, addressing the problem, then fixing the cyano will mean that that cyano doesn't come back. Um, let's see. If you're having algae issues, light is the easiest control. Most corals only need about six to eight hours. Um, and most likely you're probably running them way stronger than they ever really need to be dial it down a little bit and see if it doesn't not affect the cores. I'm willing to bet that it doesn't. You know, kind of step down your light in intensity, especially if you've got a long photo period. You know, most of these corals are arguably mostly deep sea. You know, we're talking like over 10, 15 feet. So the light isn't that intense. That's why we give a lot of blues. You know, arguably, you know, you throw a Hydra 56 or a 52 on that tank and you crank it up to 100%. Dude, nowhere in nature is that like that. Dude, like, even in a tropical ocean, dude, that's like insane amount of light. It's like, and it's just blaring down on these corals. Those, that, that algae in its skin is going to freak out and it's going to bleach out because it's so freaked out. You know, dial the lights down. Um, when acclimating, corals to a tank, try to choose a, ch a shaded spot 
and then slowly work it up to where you want it in the aquarium. Instead of, you know, sticking that that wonderful Anubias or Bacifalandra that you just got directly under the brightest spot in the tank and wondering why it melted. Same thing with the, with the coral. Um, one of the most primary issues and the, the, the more difficult ones in a saltwater tank is cyanobacteria. By cyanobacteria it is a bacteria that has a symbiotic relation and actually can live off of life. But it's a bacteria. So it usually looks like a red slime. Um, usually cyano is indicative of overfeeding, low flow. Cyano usually gets blown off with almost any amount of flow. Give it more flow. Most people do not realize if you've never dealt with salt water, to add more flow. Honestly, I'm probably flipping, like I've probably got, I've got a 20 gallon and I've got two massive power heads blasting through that thing, plus the return pump. What about the corals that they say require less flow than the other corals? Usually you can always find spots in your tank that are, are lower flow, and that's usually where I kind of hide those corals. Okay. But in a tank like that, oftentimes, like having sand, avoiding s deep sand beds, places where you're going to, don't create a tank that's going to have problems. You know, don't go with a bunch of low flow corals and put a deep sand bed and put a live, bunch of live rock that's going to trap all the detritus and then go, oh my God, this isn't working out. And you're like, well, yeah, you, you, you set yourself up for failure. Whereas if you would have gone on glass bottom, you know, and gone with like more lower flow kind of uh, like a gyro, uh, is a gyro pump. It's like a, it's a multi-directional twisting power head. Those tend to be a little bit less strong. Um, or, you know, a spinner, you know, I generally don't like wave makers. Personally, I have problems with wave makers. Salt water tends to, to calcify around magnets. So your impellers, when they turn on and off and on and off, and you do that for about three years, and all of a sudden they, they go to turn on and they go, and then no one notices, and all of a sudden you're like, man, why is the fish all gasping? Why are my corals all acting weird? It's because your, your circulation pump hasn't been coming on because it, you know, you've got it going on and off and on and off and on and off. You know, it's sort of like overtaxing the refrigerator, whereas if it was on 24-7, it would have never built up all that calcium on it. Or you'd notice when it wasn't running. But that on-off thing, I, I'm of the opinion, you know, get a circulating fan or something, but leave those, those circulation fans on 24-7. Um, flow is usually the issue with cyanide. So, you know, trying to determine a good flow source, pushing it around, spinning it around, you get to where you know flow in a, a saltwater tank. Um, they can handle a lot more. Imagine that these corals come from the ocean. <laughs> I don't know if you've been to the ocean, and stood in a wave, but it turns out that they're pretty strong. Dude, they can usually knock you over. So dude, these corals are okay with a little bit of, of action. You know, it, they, they can handle a lot more than we give them credit for. Um, one easy way to fix cyano is using an erythro or erythromycin or chemicline, which says it doesn't have antibiotics, but it's got some sort of erythromycin-like characteristic in it, which I don't understand how they can legally say is not an antibiotic, but you know, I'll leave that for chemists and organic chemists that are far smarter than I am. Um, it's kind of cool, but you know, look into it. Basically, you just dose it. My issue is once you dose erythro or chemicline, get ready. Your protein skimmer is about to go to town. It will start like vomiting from like every orifice and start dumping. You just put a trash bag over it and just let it run back into the aquarium, the sump. It, it will go haywire. If you have a hang on bag, dude, turn it off. 
Dude, until you water change enough that erythro out, dude, it will go insane. Um, and what's tricky with erythro is it also tends to deprive it of oxygen. So try to add in an air stone or something. Yes, you will get micro bubbles, dude. You will eat, you've got your choice of micro bubbles or dead fish. Dude, those are your choices. Live with a little bit of micro bubbles until you can get the erythro out. Um, one algae that has been fairly tricky in dealing in, in the hobby, and usually it comes in on little frags and stuff, is bryopsis. A lot of people will see hair algae. Hair algae is different than bryopsis. Bryopsis is a very specific kind of hair algae, and it's nothing. All of our normal cleanup crew, like hermit crabs and stuff that normally eat green hair algae, dude, it turns out that this stuff tastes really bad. It's really bad. Like, it is like, they like the green hair algae, they do not like the bryopsis. It is foul tasting things. Tangs won't even eat it. Nothing will eat this stuff. It is really, really bad. And once it starts going, it is everywhere. It is like, plague level. All of a sudden, you know, one day you got it, a little spot, and then do, two weeks later, it is everywhere in the tank. It will drive you insane. You can try blackouts, but your corals start acting up, and then they start throwing out chemicals because they're dying, and it, it becomes a spiral down into madness. It, um, turns out that there is a antifungal that Honestly, people get prescribed. Uh, it's fluconazole. Uh, it's prescribed for like dogs and cats, I don't know, all sorts of things. Humans get it prescribed. But it breaks down a protein in which macro algaes are able to process. So, but it's safe for corals and inverts and everything else. So you dose the tank with it. For the first week, it will look like nothing. It looks like the bryopsis is still happy and strong. And then about 10 days in, all of a sudden, it starts all turning brown, all dying. If you have ornamental macroalgae, like dragon's breath, or blue something, it will kill that as well. So remove that prior to dosing the spaganosol. But then all of a sudden, once it starts dying, Get something in there. I usually use a toilet brush. Toilet brushes are awesome. Dude, go and buy you a nice toilet brush. Do not get the one from the toilet. <laughs> Turns out that it's seen a lot of dangerous things that your reef has not liked to see. So, yeah, get a, get a toilet brush and brush all that stuff off. Get it out, water change it, and you should be fine. It, it basically kills off all of the little bits. Other algae. Coralline algae is a natural kind of algae. A lot of people like it. Um, it kind of grows in pink and purple. There's, it's actually kind of coral algae. Um, it's usually a sign of a good reef. Urchins love eating it. So if you want it to grow, don't get a bunch of urchins. It will eat it. Um, hair algae. Not usually, could be a sign of a good reef, but yeah. Turns out that most people don't like hair algae. Um, use your cleanup crew and water changes. Usually you've got rising phosphates um, that you've introduced from food. Food is your usual source of phosphate. Or your RODI is failing and you're getting pollutants in that way. A lot of times that's whenever you need to start looking and checking your RODI that it's working properly. Um, Green spot algae is not really common in a reef tank. I rarely ever see it. Usually it's like a green coralline algae. Um, and nuisance macros. Dude, I really love seeing grape calerpa. I love grape calerpa. It's a terrific macro algae in the sump. But you get that going in your reef tank, and let me tell you what, what you, how you treat that reef tank, it loves it. And it, it becomes highly invasive. Like, dude, it is everywhere. Uh, fern calerp is the same way. Uh, just, if it gets kind of set, you might end up having to use a fluconazole to get rid of it. 
because man, a tiny piece breaks and you, you've got another runner going. You know, it's like crabgrass in your yard. Um, all right, next thing that I think is really important, an issue that a lot of people don't pay attention to in a, a saltwater tank is oxygen. Oxygen in salt water is about half of what it is in fresh. So that's one of the reasons that aquarium, saltwater aquariums last about two or three hours after walk, after your power goes out and they start dying. It's because your oxygen levels are much, much lower. So the way to increase oxygen, you can you can add in a bubble. But you're gonna get micro bubbles and it, and it will be a hot mess. That's why I usually don't see that. Can it work? Yeah, it can work just, just fine. You know, you can, in, power goes out, dude, throw on a battery bubbler on that thing. It will save your tank. You want kind of flow and you want oxygenation. That's why a lot of individuals use a sump system, is to, to highly oxygenate that water. Um, one thing that I've seen people will go, to, I keep having to top off this sump. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna fill the sump up really hot. Very effective tactic for not topping off the sump. Very effective tool for killing off all your oxygenation. All those bio balls that it was falling through that's oxygenated now are full. So dude, there is no break and there's no oxygenation. And they're like, dude, all my fish died. And you're like, yeah. Now you just killed off all your oxygen. Um, circulation pumps, you see all this surface agitation? Oxygen occurs at that surface. So the more like agitation you can occur on that surface and ripping and roaring, the better you are. Um, I have seen ozone units used. Um, you usually need an ORP sensor, which is a oxygen reduction point. Uh, that's how you measure your oxygen, and basically it's a huge like electronic gadget that hammers in oxygen, and it goes into your skimmer, and that's what shoots into your skimmer, and you just basically super saturate it. Caveat there, fish can get oxygen, oxygen, the oxygen <laughs> drunk. They will actually swim around and slam into the glass. If the oxygen is too high, they're not used to it, that that's a bad thing. So you need to know that it needs to shut off. It's kind of like a CO2 unit. A little CO2 in a planet tank's really a good thing. A whole bunch, turns out that's bad. Yeah, CO2 kills things. <laughs> Oxygen the same way. Just a little, little goes a long way. Diseases. Um, diseases is a big problem. Everybody goes, oh my God, you know, did the dreaded salt water ick. Saltwater velvet. Da, da, da. Da, da. Yeah. Um, will you see diseases? Yeah. I mean, honestly, 95% of the saltwater fish come from the wild. It, you're going to see it. Uh, they're held in holding systems that are usually connected. So if one thing has it, almost all the things have it. All the little internal critters that hang out in there, probably you're still in. Um, in a reef, it's tricky because all those wonderful, effective tools like copper would kill all your invertebrates. Most people don't have quarantines. I realize that. I live in the real world along with y'all. Whenever a fish has uh, a disease, the best way to deal with it is just to let it ride it out. It, you know, I mean, you can, you can bang your head against the wall and set up another quarantine tank and pull that sick fish out. But it, by this time, saltwater it's already in the tank. So dude, moving it to a quarantine tank, now you just got two tanks with it. it. You know, if you can have that tank just sit fishless for two months, then yes, it will die in that tank. But dude, not a whole lot of people like sitting and looking at a fishless tank for two months. It's not as much fun. Let them ride it out, dude. You know, a lot of times dude, they'll get over it and do a UV sterilizer is effective, but UV sterilizers also heat up water. Also, pay attention to flow rates. 
UV sterilizer works by water flowing through a UV bulb. They're really awesome, but a lot of them need contact time. So it will kill saltwater ig as long as it's got contact time of like 10 seconds. So if you put it on an amazing pump that's flipping the tank eight times an hour, you just blow it right by it. It doesn't have enough contact time to actually do the thing you want. That's why I think that a lot of Sun Sun UV sterilizers aren't effective because it's working off of the pump, which is awesome for flipping the tank, but dude, arguably that's just a neon accoutrement that now all of a sudden your, your, your filter glows. Cool, it doesn't do anything because the, the tank is moving, the filter is moving so fast, it's blowing right by it. it you just got a cool neon glow to your filter. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Like, I like the idea, but it's doing nothing. Um, flat worms. I think they're they're little bitty red worms. They're also photosynthetic, so they they get out there and they just get to get prime real estate. And the prime real estate in a saltwater reef tank is right on the core. So they all kind of go, look, I'm just going to lay right here. And they all get all over the coral. And you're like, oh man, what are all those red flat things? That, that's gross. And then they're all moving around. Um, there is a flatworm exit that basically just kind of kills them. Turns out they're poisonous. That's why a whole lot of stuff doesn't eat them. So do, if you have a whole bunch of them and you use that flatworm exit, you just basically nuked a whole bunch of poisonous critters. Now they're just dying and oozing into the water column. Turns out that a lot of your corals don't like that. They're like, dude, this is terrible. So you want to definitely water change almost immediately. You know, you want to do a good 50% water change. You know, kind of plan it out. You know, give them enough time to die and suck them all out. Um, let's see. Spaghetti worms, vermetid worms, or snails. They're not really dangerous, per se. I mean, they're going to definitely kill off like any sort of pod colony that you got. Um, they're basically these like little like worms, and they vomit out this long string of stuff. It's mucus. They're fishermen. So they throw that out, and they catch stuff, and then they pull that slime thing back in. It's gross, it's not exactly the prettiest thing, but it turns out certain aquariums can just rock them. I love them. Is that? I love them. Uh, it's um, cool, it's like, look at it go. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, again, it's I like what, what some people like, <laughs> other people get driven crazy by. Yep. Um, I've got a tank that's got, got a rocking colony. Uh, some rats will eat them. Um, I've also heard that just taking basically a, a screwdriver and just <laughs> bagow, <laughs> they'll be gone. Just keep smacking them and crushing them. Whack they'll them eventually all. go away. Um, but yeah, again, what one person likes, one person doesn't. Just uh, they can drive you crazy. Uh, especially whenever they snot up everywhere. You got like 30 snail trails of snot just going. Is that what this is in here? In Hawaii, I was um, swimming in Shark's Cove and there were some strands that were seven, eight feet long. Whoa. Um, all coming out, I tracked it back to where they were all coming out. I thought it was a cool thing. Uh -huh. So when my little nano tank had one, it was, of course, just a little like a long, but it was just kind of cool seeing it. Seeing that the reproduce. Yeah. Of it, you know, in real life. Uh, I've, so, yeah. I've seen, you know, a 280 gallon of chocolate block full that's been running for like 12 years. And it, after a water. Is that what change, that is? Um, no, that looks like. No, that might be. Yeah. Yeah, you see the tube where it's actually coming out and it's throwing that trail? Mm hmm. Yeah, and eventually, once it kind of collects it, it will start dragging it back in. It's fishing, and it's get, catching all the little critters in the water. Um, but yeah, you take a, you know, a lot of times on coral, you'll get them in. Because 
it kind of burrows down. So even if you dip a coral, it's way down in that rock. It's not going to get affected by that dip. So whenever you put that coral in the tank, it's all like, oh, hey, man, this is awesome. <laughs> I'm hungry. And you're like, no. I think you're, yeah. Too bad you can't use them to catch damsels in it. Right? I'm telling you. Um, I've also heard that super glue, because that's what we use, you know, you use super glue to attach corals. Super glue that mouth shut. <laughs> Best Sometimes diet they'll ever. find another hole out. At that point, dude, just take you a screwdriver. <laughs> yeah. Get after it. Make sure it work up. Um, another uh, common problem, the nudibranchs are really cool. And if you know what your nudibranch is eating and you introduce the nudibranch for that purpose, there is a flatworm eating nudibranch. It is black and blue. They're really cool. Um, once they eat up all the flatworms, that's all they eat. You aren't going to find another food source. Most nudibranchs eat one thing, one thing only. So it will start slowly dying and starve to death. Um, sea hares are really awesome for eating algae. Once it eats all your algae, it will die. And it is, it's like a big, huge, snotty ball. It's really gross. <laughs> Find another home. Um, but you're looking at your aquarium, and all of a sudden you see this amazing blue and yellow spotted little sea angel come floating out. And you're like, oh my gosh, that's awesome. And you're like, what are you feeding that? And they go, I don't know, I don't feed it anything. I didn't even know it was in there. And you're like, let me tell you what, if you're not feeding it, it's finding food in there. And usually, it's coral. So dude, all those wonderful corals, it is feasting upon. They're really cool, but they eat corals. So dude, if you don't know, and you didn't put it in there specifically, remove it. You will, otherwise it's gonna to continue to eat corals, and then it's going to lay some eggs, and it's going to have about 30 of its cousins show up, and it's going to eat more of your coral, and then eventually you're going to have a bunch of well-fed nudibranchs and a bunch of dead coral. Um, pay attention to, to nudibranchs. They look cool, uh, but I've had to tell clients that show, shoot me a picture of a, a nice little sea slug, and I go, no, yeah. no, yeah, we didn't put that in there. Take it out. <laughs> it's finding food somewhere. Um, Asterina starfish. Some people don't mind it. They usually spot the little starfish and they go, ooh, that's a cute little starfish. There's a whole bunch of different species. Some eat corals. Some don't. Some are harmless. Some just kind of pick up and move around. But they can get to plague levels. If you're having problems with Asterinas, uh, honestly, there is a shrimp all it does is eat live starfish. That's all it eats. You put one of those in there, and guess what? It will find every little last one of them, and it will hunt them down, and it will eat them. And it only eats live starfish. And whenever it gets done, then it starts and it dies. But your starfish problem is addressed. Um, you know, some people don't mind starfish. Again, it's all up to you. You know, uh, they're a lot like MTS. You know, some people don't mind MTS. You know, they keep it at that level. But some people, dude, you know, you got 8,000 of them in your tank. Like, dude, this is getting kind of crazy. You know. Well um, Glass anemones, what we call aptasia. They can kind of come in, they're kind of pestly. Usually, they're a little bit tricky because they come in and they've hidden down in the crack of something. And you're not going to be easily get at it. Aptasia X is uh, basically like a, a fluid and it comes with a hypodermic needle. And you wait till it, it kind of is out and it's all like, hey, what's going on? It's looking to eat. And you kind of jam that thing down into it and you shoot it with a bunch of that stuff and it kind of goes, Ugh! It turns out it doesn't like getting hyper a hypodermic injection of this white goo and it just slowly rots away and it dies. And yeah, jam it in there. <laughs> Bam. Because otherwise, the one Aptasia will become 12 Aptasias, and they're all over the tank. 
and for every one that you're seeing, there's like three of them behind the live rock that you can't get to. So do act quick. So you don't use a screwdriver for that one. <laughs> do you, can, you? If you did, you've got 15 pieces that just went and they're now landed and found new homes and they're going to grow new ones. So power head, sucking it won't work. You could try. Uh, no, it's, yeah, it, it's just. It, <laughs> Hit it with adaptation. So the pieces of it will regrow into other adaptation. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Mahanos are the same way. Mahanos actually look cool. Whenever you first see the first Mahano, you're like, oh my god, it's nice. It's kind of got green and it's a little red. Dude. Next thing you know, dude, it's, there's like 15 of them right next to your corals and they're like, sting, 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 sting. And dude, they're killing corals left and right. You're like, ugh, dude, I don't want a Mahano tank. If you want a Mahano tank, dude, they're real easy. Everybody will give you Mahanas. But take steps to address the Mahanas. Aptasia X will work. Also, cough wasser. Also, boiling hot water will also work. Literally, just get a bunch of boiling hot water, get a hypodermic needle, and just jam it into its mouth and dude, just shoot it full. Dude, turns out it doesn't like that. It will die. You're like, ha! Ah, I've won. Hey! The reef is a violent world. <laughs> violent world. Um, yeah, super glue. Shoot, shoot super glue on its face and its mouth. Dude, turns out that doesn't do good things for life either. Exactly. Yeah, if you see anything with cute little tentacles, don't assume it's some kind of an enemy. First, assume it's going to be. It's bad. Yeah, it's, it's bad. bad for us. That's what it's going to be. Um, file fish. There's, there is an Aptasia eating file fish. They do eat Aptasia. Uh, they've got the name Aptasia eating file fish. But be aware that once it runs out of Aptasias, a lot of things look like Aptasia, especially <laughs> zoanthids. And then, dude, it starts finding food. Um, all of a sudden, your zoas start disappearing. And you're like, damn. Well, where do all my zoas go? Yeah, your file fish ran out of food, so it's going to keep finding. Peppermint shrimp do really good with them. Peppermint shrimp, but sometimes they'll. Not all peppermint shrimp are created equal. Yep. Yeah. The first batch um, didn't take care of them. The second batch did. I've never yeah. had one of the same since. Exactly. So. Um, bristle worms. Okay. I'm going to talk to you guys about bristle worms. This is one of those like points of like, oh my god, I have a bristle worm. And you're like, oh, dude. bristle worms, dude, there's like 2,000 of them per square foot in the, in the ocean. There's a bunch of them. There's like lots. And dude, they're a sign of a healthy system. They aren't bad as long as you don't have certain highly aggressive species highly venomous species, or very large growing species. They're going to come in on coral, on live rock, you will get bristle worms. If you have a tank that like you put in food and 8,000 bristle worms come rolling out, then yeah, you've got a problem. You know, that's like MTS. You, usually it's a sign of overfeeding and nothing eating the bristle worms. Um, a lot of grasses will eat bristle different, you know, polychaete worms, um, arrow crabs, those huge spider-looking crabs that everybody's like, oh my god, those are gross. That's why you put those in a reef. Dude, those things, man, they're like stilt, like stilted ninjas, man. They, there's, a, there's a bristle worm, dude, bam, dude, he's got it, and he's just holding it, eating it. Do they use a screwdriver? Jam dude, it in they there? do not use a screwdriver, but they've got like, their claws are kind of like screwdrivers. <laughs> bam. Um, and removal. They get you one of them aquatons, those Eheim aquatons, and then you can become your own little like ninja fisherman. Um, thaw food prior to feeding it. You don't throw in frozen food. Frozen food oftentimes just kind of like the fish will get confused and they will stop wanting to eat it because they got a face full of numb. And they're like, no, dude, I don't like that. That's the that's the Bernie face. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, dude, the food kind of falls to the bottom, and dude, the bristle worms are like, oh hey, dude, it's food time. Do -do -do -do. Um, we had an aquarium that you could tell somebody didn't thaw the food, 
because yeah, they, they went through frozen food every time, and the fish would run from the food, and the bristle worms would just roll out. And if you're like, you are feeding the straight frozen, they just yeah, just thaw it ahead of time. You know, dose it in there small, and you let the fish eat it. Don't overfeed. Um, right. Um, feeding. Again, thaw your food, rinse your food. All that wonderful water that comes in on that frozen stuff is chock a block full of nitrates and phosphates. Dude, just do a little rinse on it, you know, rinse that kind of bad mojo out, then feed the, the food. Um, nori sheets. A lot of people are like, dude, you should feed your tang some algae sheets. And they're like, man, they, these algae sheets are awesome. They put in all these like clips of algae sheets, and they got a little, a little, little clipper holder. And they just, the next thing you know, about a month later, dude, they got an algae problem. And they're like, man, dude, I don't know what's going on. And you're like, all right. So those are actually processed with phosphates. So you have been just jam packing your tank with phosphates. Use a phosphate sponge when you're using them. Make certain that to, to keep up with the phosphates fine. You're basically just adding phosphates. I'm not saying don't use them, just don't overfeed them, you know, and use a phosphate sponge to pull it out. Um, I think that's about all I got. Uh, does anybody got any questions? How long do the phosphate sponges usually last? It depends on the phosphate level. Um, certain phosphate sponge media lasts a lot longer like a GFO reactor, right. but like honestly, just throwing in a polyfilter pad and then you change it out once every month, dude, usually will knock out most of my problems. Okay. Dude, it just pulls it out and I just toss out the pad, throw in another one, you know. Um, if you're using macroalgaes, like in a sump, is that counterproductive to any of the other things you do try and get rid of algae or no no honestly it actually sucks up a lot of your phosphates mm -hmm. in the sump basically you're growing algae in the sump instead of growing it in your tank right and usually i try to make certain and on my refugiums i leave the lights going 24 7 um just so it doesn't become sexual right in 24 7 i use a plant light because they don't really need all the blues. The actinic sums a whole lot for algae. So I hammer it with a, a 10K or a 65K LED, and I go full wide open 24-7, and I usually have to pull out fistfuls every week and just tuck it out. If you do... No, no. Um, I, I mean, at that point, if you're if you're having a pH issue, then usually you're... you're you're dropping in like uh, your alkalinity, so you just have to like dose like a reef A or B, you know, kind of bump up your magnesium and uh, your calcium, you know, an alkalinity mix. Is it a good or a bad idea to do like both macroalgae thing going on in the sump and like a GFO reactor? I mean, can you yeah, add no, them together? Yeah, no, honestly, you can have them together. Okay. And honestly, if the algae has nothing to grow, you're, you've been successful. So, it, you know, the refugium, the purpose of it is to basically eliminate algae in your main tank. Sometimes we forget, we're like, but, but I, I want to grow algae. What if it stops growing? You're like, well, you've achieved your goal. <laughs> but will the GFO reactor counteract the macroalgae, no. like, like make it so the macroalgae doesn't grow? No, no, basically it just kind of locks in your phosphates. Okay. Um... Anything, any other questions? Um, and I'll give it a second. I, I want to make certain to, to let Paul give his uh, 25 cents worth, see if I, I messed up too much. <laughs> He's a reef guru. Don't, don't let him fool you. Great, man. You're doing a great job. Oh, hi. Hi. everything. <laughs> you don't leave me anything to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, I... I try to cover it all, but you know, I, I'm certain I missed a few things. Yeah, no problem. Um, I don't know. Uh, have you found like that there's a certain thing that 
really just water changes and you know kind of you're taking care of your your husbandry what is your first mode of attack when you have an algae issue in a, in a algae issue uh, first thing you do is uh, water change cut down the lighting introduce some more uh, invertebrate like you know herbivores, crabs snail seal um, and the last thing is phosphate removal yeah. If you do a combination of all that, you should control that as you do what. Gotcha. Well, I want to thank you for having us today. Yeah, no I problem. appreciate it. Wonderful, man. Thank you for coming. And, thank you guys. and honestly, you know, you guys look around the shop. I'm certain that there's always something to, to pick up. You know, he's a great sponsor, and we are proud to be here. Thank you.